on this computer. All right. So um, we're welcome everybody to the lecture by Dr. Stone. Um, he's been a great supporter of the Connor Society. He's a past Southeast region president and he helped host a regional meeting just a few years ago at the Baker Arboretum. He's a professor at Western Kentucky University and director of the Jerry Baker Arboretum in Bowling Green, um, where they have a great collection of conifers and Japanese maples, um, and soon to have a bonsai collection, if I'm allowed to say that. If I wasn't, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Um, that's fine. Yeah. So uh, welcome, everybody, and Dr. Stone, take it away. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Jeff. I know some of you, and again, Dave, Sherry, it's good to see you all the way from cold and snowy Wisconsin, I'm sure. Byron, uh, up in Ohio, it's good to see you and others who I may have met or may not have met. It's good to see you, too. Um, I, uh, I, Zoom, I Zoom teach some, and so it's a little familiar to me, and I don't mind it um, that much, really. It's not that bad. Uh, but I do teach a class every fall called uh, Landscape Plants. And, you know, we go identify uh, trees and learn Latin names. And I, did, uh, I, I couldn't do that <clears throat> over Zoom. And I'm teaching a class this next semester um, where we learn to graft um, plants. And that's hard to do uh, by Zooming. But uh, otherwise, I, I have been surviving and so have the students. And so it's not been that bad at all. Um, I'm going to talk to you today <clears throat> about 25-year uh, plant survival uh, at the uh, Baker Arboretum. We have keeping our records there for a long time. And a few years ago, our accessionist, Peggy McKillop, who, if you know Peggy, she just retired about two weeks ago. Uh, Peggy uh, uh, and I were thinking, you know, why don't we do something with all of this data we've been keeping all these years um, in our um, in our um, in our files, uh, and so we decided to investigate conifers and to see uh, which. Because you know, why do we keep these records? We keep the records to see which ones survive, uh, which ones um, don't survive, and we should um, go for the ones that do better for us and start to give up on the ones that don't do so well for us. And that's kind of where we are now. And I'm happy to share that with you. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, go ahead and share my screen with you. Um, and if you all uh, get to where you can't hear me, let me know. Uh, I live on a farm out in the country in Kentucky. And so um, if you, um, if I need to, I can link my, uh, my laptop with my, uh, with my phone. <clears throat> so um, let's see, I don't know if I shared with you or not. Hold on. Did I share that with you? I don't think so. I, I, I did what I shouldn't have done. Hold on. Give me a, give me a second here. Uh, give me just, oh shoot. Give me just a second here. Uh, let me go back to my zoom call. It's been a couple of weeks since I've zoomed and I've already forgotten how to do it. Uh, okay. So now I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. And let me go ahead and pull that up. All right. Let me minimize all your beautiful faces. Um, and so I originally gave this talk uh, in February at Purdue University, um, and I called it a 25-year survival uh, survey of conifer survival in the uh, lower Midwest. Uh, but for us, I changed it to the upper south because uh, I'm in the southeast region. But really, for those of you in the Midwest, it's not that, it's not that different. <clears throat> um, let me um, orient you to the talk today. I'm going to give you some... Um, numbers about the conifers and uh, not just conifers, but species at the Baker Arboretum, some information about the I want you to stay with me on that um, because by that time you're already most of the way into the talk and you can't back out. Uh, so uh, I hope you'll enjoy the journey with me. Okay. So <clears throat> to note where we are, um, you can see I've got my cursor moving here. Um, here's the U.S. hardiness zones, and I've put a little star here on, um, on Bowling Green, Kentucky. We are in southwestern Kentucky, about one hour north of Nashville. 
our zone has been creeping up the last few years. Uh, 20 years ago, we were a solid zone six um, and now uh, 6B, and now we're practically zone 7A or close to 7A or soon will be in 7A. So the growing environment has gotten a little friendlier uh, for plants that need a little bit longer growing season, a little bit, um, I don't know if it's warmer, it's just longer uh, growing season. But um, you can see that the green there in uh, central Illinois um, and uh, in central Missouri, that's, uh, and then the lighter green just below it, that's the zone six. And then the yellows in uh, Alabama and Tennessee and the light greens, that's zone seven. And you all are a little bit everywhere, I realize, but that's kind of where we are. And you see that that's a pretty broad swath um, that goes essentially um, all the way from um, Boston area, New York, right? It goes up uh, the East Coast and then it comes down mm -hmm. through the mid uh, uh, upper South and the Midwest. <clears throat> and then it gets convoluted by the uh, elevations of the Rocky and Sierra Mountains. Um, but this is our location. The Baker Arboretum is in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Um, it's 115 acres, making it the second largest arboretum or public garden in the state of Kentucky. Bernheim is the largest, if you've ever heard of Bernheim or been to Bernheim. Uh, it was, uh, it's, um, it's run on um, whiskey or bourbon money, and it's much larger, just like 15,000 acres or something like that. But uh, we're zone 6B or, or, or uh, maybe 7A now. Uh, it was begun in 1992 by Jerry Baker to benefit the region, and it was designed by Mitchell Leishart, who was a landscape architect. There's a picture of Mitchell there before he passed away in 2015 at his home here in Bowling Green, and it's an affiliate of WKU, Western Kentucky University. I'm a professor there on, on the campus, and then, of course, the director of the Arboretum, and I share students and resources. Uh, there's a lot of sharing that goes on uh, between the two affiliates. It's, it's really quite nice. Um, Mr. Baker, Jerry wanted the Arboretum to be a place of science, and he died, by the way, in 2017, so it's been about three, three and a half years, a place of science and art. He uh, was a business person and didn't really, um, he liked art, and he liked horticulture from the art point of view, not the science point of view necessarily, but we have uh, directed collections uh, of plants, which you're going to hear about. And then we have the Downing Museum uh, on site, which is an art museum that I'm not really going to talk about, but you'll see it in the background. It's a very nice museum. By the way, the Arboretum and the museum are free and always will be free because Mr. Baker left enough money for it to run on an endowment. He never wanted price to be a barrier for anyone in our region to visit and see good art, good horticulture, the nicer things in life. Um, it's been very popular since it opened to the public after his death in 2017. It was kind of a little private until he passed away. Then we flung the doors open and we've seen, um, we've seen geometric growth uh, the last few years. A little, there's a little, if I could capture the uh, Arboretum, for those of you who have not been there, if I could capture the Arboretum in one picture, it's this picture. Lots of really well done um, stonework, um, uh, hardscaping with uh, camisipris, pine, and Japanese maple, contrasting color and texture and size and form, not flowers and not uh, Martha Stewart garden, but more of a European style garden. There are very few flowers in it, but the idea that it would be beautiful 24 seven, 365, and in fact it is. And again, it, it relies on hardscape and conifers contrasting with colorful foliage and then art in there. So it's a delightful garden to be in, um, even when it's cold. Even today, I was in the garden all day at the Arboretum, and it was just a pleasure to be there. Let's talk about our uh, collections just briefly. We specialize in conifers, especially dwarf conifers, but not exclusively dwarf conifers. We have 115 species of conifers, 30 genera, and over 1,900 conifer plants in the collections. Uh, we also like our small Asian maples. Those would be the uh, japonicums, the palmatums, the shirasawanums, and, and others. Uh, we have 18 species of, of maples, uh, over 160 uh, species, or, or rather cultivars of Japanese maple. Uh, we also like Circus, which is red bud, the native red bud, <clears throat> and its cultivars. We have three species and 20 cultivars. We have uh, Cornus, the Cornells, so the dogwoods. 12 species with 44 cultivars. And then we love our ginkgos and we're gr actively growing our ginkgo collection, mainly um, brooms, ginkgo brooms, the dwarf ones, 
one species, of course, it's it's monotypic. It's there's one genus, one species. You know, it's the only member of its entire family, the Ginkgoaceae family. Uh, 22 cultivars and growing. Although the uh, groundhogs tried to uh, cut those. Uh, and did cut that 22 down a little bit this last year. But in total, we have about 14 and a half thousand total living woody plants in the collections. Those include native plants as well. And, and there's actually a lot more than that. But um, so it's um, it's got a fair number of uh, specialized plants in it. Here's a picture of Mr. Baker uh, sitting out in the garden in 2013. That was 2013, just uh, four years before he passed away. So um, there's the uh, uh, the uh, Downing Museum in the background. Uh, of course, it's snowy at times, and of course, I'm going to show you some pretty some nice pictures of the arboretum. The the witch hazel, uh, a small collection of witch hazels, which I didn't really talk about. Um, we have a lot of art. Uh, one of the uh, favorite places of people is uh, the picture. Uh, these pictures are in a place called the the Reflection Garden, and that's a fountain that runs year round or almost year round, and there's some espaliered pear trees and a lot of tropical plants. And uh, a lot of people get married in this place. A lot of people come and sit and read and contemplate. It's a very peaceful little vignette within the garden. Um, we have places to have, um, you know, um, my interns, we have lunch out here on the patio uh, sometimes um, and uh, some nice art. That's Rachel, statue of Rachel there um, with, uh, with a, a, a garden juniper there in a container. The winter jasmine is doing, uh, it's flowering today. <laughs> it's a wonderful plant. It, it's so much earlier than a forsythia. Uh, it's in flower today. Those plants are in flower today. Uh, then when you're inside the museum and you're looking out, it's also delightful because the, the, the architecture is such that the views are really uh, well uh, framed. And so this is inside the art museum looking out at a fountain and some of the Beautiful foliage there in the in the woods. Uh, the picture on the right is on the roof of the museum, looking down into one of our little courtyards with Japanese maples and some ground covers. Just some nice shots of the foliage in the fall, or as as it were on the left, or on the spring, as it were on the right. That's a a um, um, weeping uh, Hygan uh, cherry, the double flowering cherry, the autumnalis. Uh, a part of the museum there with a fountain, not the same fountain I showed you, but a different fountain. And there's a, on the left uh, where my cursor's kind of hovering, that's a big uh, Norway spruce. And our signature plant is right here, uh, just to the right of the fountain. That's a big, beautiful Skylands Oriental spruce. We love it. Uh, but this, uh, this uh, area here has a Suga diversifolia um, and, um, and a, a larch growing. Uh, there's a lot of conifer diversity in this part of the garden. Of course, the Japanese maple collection is uh, one of the best. Uh, lots and lots of colors, um, lots and lots of textures, as you can see. The picture on the far right is Baldsmith is the cultivar. That's got to be one of our favorite Japanese maples. And the Japanese maples, of course, contrast really beautifully with the very yellow color of the ginkgos, which we consider a conifer uh, by um, just by, um, uh, by um, just, just because it kind of is. And you can see that it looks good on the left, contrasted against a Japanese maple. That's a blood good, I believe. And then the picture on the right, it's contrasted against a weeping Norway spruce and it looks both good in both places. And I will tell you that it's planted there, not by accident. It's planted there to get this, these two views and some other views as well. Uh, so just some things that we do at the Arboretum I'd like to brag a little bit about. Got a big grant a few years ago, about $150,000 grant from the Transportation and Environmental Department. And this is a um, food digester that we have where you can see the picture there in the middle, the green tote looking down on that there's hamburgers and cheese and what else. We get Starbucks and anything from campus, they bring it out to us. And then the picture on the far right is a mailbox where we have a data logger and we weigh the food that we put into this digester. And this is the backside of the digester. In about 30 or 40 days, it comes out um, as compost. And so we're taking campus food waste and creating soil with it. And we use it, every bit of it, we use it uh, to build our gardens and uh, to make more beds here at the, uh, at the Arboretum. So it's really nice. 
Um, we have uh, co collections uh, not only of flowers, but also of fruits. Uh, that's a nice uh, oriental um, calicarpa there on the left. Um, we do events and we use, so that, that, that flower there, that, that uh, arrangement has hydrangea and the purple is cleome or cleome. And there's a few other things in there, but every bit of that came from our grounds. And so we tried not to buy uh, flowers when we have a, a wedding or an event or a speaker or something. Uh, we try to make them up from the, the grounds. Uh, on the left is uh, inside the, um, uh, the museum where we have uh, speakers here. Um, and, and, and then on the right is a picture of people enjoying the, um, the grounds of the Arboretum and the museum. Um, just beautiful things all around. There's some of our uh, red bud collection. That's one of my interns a few years ago. She's wearing that, um, that uh, calicanthus uh, flower and the magnolia family, Thomas Jefferson's uh, favorite plant there. She's actually now my master's student at the university working on a database from the Arboretum collection. Uh, just briefly, I'll, I won't linger, but I think it's nice to see these Japanese maples and you can see the dogwood there on the right through the through the way. And then we really use a lot of tropicals and cacti and succulents around as temporary. We have over 120 planters that we take care of every day that are full of succulents and ferns or, or what have you. If we're having an event, we'll take flowers and put in the fountain and float things in the dahlias or what, what, whatever in the garden uh, fountain there to, to make it more festive. Um, the planting, the sunburst pattern on the right is uh, what you see before you walk into the museum. And, and so it really catches visitors eyes. And that's a conifer, by the way, growing in the center. That's a, uh, that's a taxodium. Taxodium, um, I think it's disticum is what that one particular one is. Uh, we like to compare, uh, we like to contrast the blue fescue there on the left with the hardscapes, with the, uh, the purple flowers of the uh, tropical uh, salvia there, uh, plectranthus there. And then on the right is this uh, reflection garden where we have the espaliered pear trees, which really get a lot of attention from our visitors. They really, if you're an old horticulturist, you're like, yeah, I mean, that's, it's not uh, uncommon to see that, but you know, a lot of visitors have, don't know about that. And and so uh, we really point that out to them and they enjoy seeing that. We host um, um, art, lots of art uh, pro projects. The, the TP on the far left is a um, art installation class from the university that comes out and does a public piece of art that we leave up for the summer. Uh, and it has a little, um, they have to prove it through us. <laughs> they uh, sometimes want to put nails through our trees or, or wrap wires around our branches. And of course we don't allow that, but. Uh, that was a pretty one there. And then we have a lot of art projects from kids, community members, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, you name it. Um, they, are, they are there. Um, let's see, I see a, there's a chat. We'll, were the pets resting by the espaliered pair, the pets? Um, I didn't, let's see if I can go back here. I didn't see any pets. Oh, yes, Byron, ashes. It, uh, there, it's a bit of a columbarium there as well. You're right. Uh, and some of Jerry's ashes are there also, and Mitchell's ashes. And so, yeah, it's a bit of a columbarium. That's right, yeah. Uh, art students come out and um, have classes. They're inspired. They draw. They sing. Um, there's one that wanted to get away in the hydrangeas. I couldn't take her picture, but she's sitting on a stump. Uh, there's our horticulturist on the right, Dennis Williams, who's taking care of one of our trough uh, succulent uh, gardens there. Lots of conifers in the background. Uh, more, more shots. I'm, I'm just going to roll through these. Uh, we have a greenhouse, two greenhouses. And as things come out of the greenhouse, uh, we rotate them in until, and they're really beautiful. Then when they go out of flower, of course, we'll rotate them back out and bring something else out to see. Some of our Japanese maple collections uh, in the uh, summer and in the fall. Very, very beautiful. Some more of our um, uh, plants that we've collected on site, except for the carrots, uh, and did floral displays, very interesting floral displays for our events. And then there's a lot of statuary, a lot of fountains here. So I encourage you to, to come and see what it's all about. 
I'm just going to go through these, uh, some more Japanese maples. We have one Japanese maple cultivar, by the way. We don't know what it is, and we'd love for you all to, uh, to come by and tell us what it is. It's a bit of a mystery. Uh, yeah, the carrots. Oh, yeah. Hey, Tracy, I didn't, um, I, I guess I didn't see you all come on there. Hope you're doing well. Uh, yeah, uh, that was a that was my favorite one. <laughs> that was really clever. I thought the carrots were really, were really, uh, and everybody just raved over them, to tell you the truth. You took a photo. That's great. If you want me to send it to you, I will. It's good to see you on here. Uh, we have uh, art, of course. Uh, there is, uh, there's mainly art of the artist downing, but, you know, they have rotating art exhibits. So here happens to be one. It's some people visiting at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, at the museum. A little pond, some succulents right there, something for everybody. Uh, we don't actually allow people, by the way, to get to this pond. You can only see this pond from the window of the museum and from one spot in the landscape, but it's an attractive nuisance. We don't really don't want little eight-year-old boys falling into that pond, which I know they would. And then some pictures of the Japanese maples and other conifers up against the, the museum there, okay? So you're getting the idea what the place uh, looks like. That's a, um, a dragon's eye uh, pine there on the left and uh, succulent there. Uh, on the right, uh, there's a picture, a little bit of the Joe Downing art in the middle, if you're wondering what his art looks like. And I thought it really, although it wasn't planned, I thought it really contrasted well with the colors of the, if you recognize the castor bean flowers on the left, the spiky balls, castor bean, or the uh, Japanese maple on the uh, right. By the way, those of you, you all are about my age, I would say, or, or younger, or maybe a little older, who cares, but um, but um, I, I've watched Breaking Bad, and I don't know if you did or not, but, you know, the, the botany angle of Breaking Bad and, and them trying to kill that bad guy making uh, meth and putting ricin in it, which is made and derived, of course, from the castor bean seeds. And so I take my students through the garden, and I like to tell them about the toxic plants and, you know, the poisonous plants and the medicinal plants. And I say, you know, you've seen Breaking Bad, and you remember that episode, and they I mean, I quit saying, I quit referencing this because they always say, you know, I've not seen that show, but my parents watch it a lot. And it's just too painful to keep hearing that. Um, some of our horticulturists here having a good time. Uh, groups out all the time. I always try to get a picture of the groups when they visit, whether they want their picture made or not. I teach a grafting class every year. Those are some of my horticulture students in the greenhouse uh, labeling some plants and grafting. And then there they are in one of our education buildings there. Uh, there's a um, got a shot down from above the balcony, uh, them uh, doing grafting, right? And so we do a lot of things here. But here's now, let's get to the data. Um, what are the best performing conifers at the Baker Arboretum? Now that you know what it's about, let's answer that question or try to. So we only looked at conifers and we only looked at survival. And let's talk about conifers for a minute. The conifers like an acidic soil pH, right? Six and a half or below, sometimes much below. But it turns out the Baker Arboretum is situated on a limestone hill uh, and it increases the pH. And so we really have to work hard to keep our pH low. And our irrigation water that we get is has a, a lot of calcium and not that much magnesium in it. And it drives our calcium levels up in our soils and drives up the pH. Uh, so we apply a lot of sulfur every year to maintain our low uh, pH. So this is a 25 year study, but you have to keep in mind that this data does not represent health. They could be the sickest plant in the world, it would still count as alive. This is only dead or alive, but over the course of 25 years, it kind of averages out. And the reasons for the plant death are not listed here. They could be plant related or they could be man-made. It could be that they were poorly adapted to the climate of the humid upper south, or they might not have liked the soil pH, or there could have been uh, really poor care before they were planted and they died in the container. Not many, not many, but a few. Tried to eliminate those though from this study. Some before I got there, uh, sometimes they're planted too deep and we see that sometimes they leave the wire cage on and it eats through the, uh, it girdles the plant on one side or even the wire tag or the um, nylon tag gets left on and it cut down a beautiful pine this year, did a post-mortem on it and it turns out that it had uh, uh, girdled uh, from a, a wire that we didn't see that was left on. Byron, I know there is um, a, a certified arborist. I'm also a certified arborist. And so it's interesting uh, to do the postmortems. Uh, disease, especially some of the conifers um, like, uh, like needle drop and pine are a real challenge. Uh, they could have died from disease, either soil borne or 
um, or, uh, or, or foliar, uh, could have insect damage, or it could be a combination of all the above where we could have had a dry year and we do irrigate, but maybe we didn't do enough one year. So it's just a host of things. So you're not gonna find out how healthy they were and you're not gonna find out what killed them. You're just gonna, we're just gonna find out if they lived or died. And that's really all we can do at this point. So here comes the Latin. These are the genera that we examined. Um, I, if you see the little box on the far right-hand corner, um, we examined 30 genera of conifers, 115 species, and over 1,900 plants in this 25-year analysis. And I'm going to list the genus, uh, genuses or genera that we looked at. So there's Platycladus. I'm not going to read them to you. You can read them yourself. I'll give you a minute to look through those. They're in no particular order. Or if they are, I've forgotten since uh, February what order I put them in, but I don't think they're in any order. <coughs> okay, so you get a feel for those there, Taxus. Juniperus, you'd expect to find. Our biggest collected plant, by the way, is the third one down, the Chemicyprus, the Hinoki cypress. We have probably more, of, I know we have more of those than anything. Some of these do well for us. Some, of course, don't. We're going to find out. Here's the next page of the genera that we grow in the conifer, um, conifer um, uh, taxonomic classification of the common names. It include ginkgos in there, suga, cydopides, Abes, Larix, you see them there. And then here's some data on each of those in the same order. There'll be two slides, the same order that you just saw, but this has some numbers with it, no longer the common name. It has the number of species that we possess in our collections and then the number of individuals of, so we, for instance, Cephalotaxis two species, but we have 162 individuals split between those two species uh, unevenly. Um, Camis, Camis, the Camisipris, four species, 228. Of course, the juniper, juniper is 10 species um, and a, a, over a thousand individuals. And you can see that some are huge and some are pretty small. So keep this in mind when we're going through these. Here's the next screen, same order we saw before. Um, high points would be Pinus, uh, Picea, Cupressus and Abes. Low points would be Cydopides with one, Sequoia with one, Cryptomeria, and, um, and Ginkgo, of course, is only one. Picea, we've got 270 individuals. Pinus, we have 257 plants split amongst 22 species of that genus. So here's the survival game here. And so the genus is on the far left column and then the common name, just to kind of keep you up on it. And then the percent survival of that genus. Now this, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because this is just genus. We're not talking about species, but I thought it'd be interesting to look at, see what genera did well. Uh, so there's actually two columns here. There's uh, three columns and then another three columns. Uh, the first column is Platycladus. The, uh, the next set of columns starts with Suga at the top there, Hemlock. And I, I've rank ordered these based on survival. So Platycladus survives at 100% for us. Cephalotaxis does really well for us, 98%. Sequoia dendron, Pseudosuga, not so much. Larix, not great. Abes, not so great, right? So the winners and the losers here, let you take a look at that. Uh, the total, our average total is 52% survival on the conifers. And I, when I saw that number, I thought that stinks. We, we should be able to do better than 52%. But then I had the pep talk with myself and I realized, hey, come on now. What we're doing is we're growing a lot of plants that are not necessarily adapted here, but we're trying them out, right? This is an experimental garden. We're not growing for um, for ornament. I mean, we are growing for ornament, but this is a place of science also. So we're going to have some stinkers and some losers, and that's perfectly okay. I will share with you that I got to peek at the Dawes Arboretum data just like this recently. Uh, it was shared with me, and they had a 48% 48, 48 survival. So we're, we're about the same. I didn't feel so bad at all then about my 52%. The generous survival, when I ran the statistics on it, it was highly significant. I mean, so uh, I don't have them broken out here. There's too many to break out, but I will say that these numbers are not just numbers. There, there was a lot of st statistical um, significance here. These are real differences that we're seeing. But let's 
uh, move on now. And let's talk about the species, which is probably what you're expecting me to talk about. I, Being a professor, I decided to group them by grade, right? So if they had a survival of 86 to 100%, I gave them an A, uh, 81 to 66, I gave them, uh, I'm, I'm a generous grader, aren't I? 66 to 81, B, 38%, still got a C. And then uh, eight to 33, got a D. And if you were zero, you got an F. And you can see the numbers in each of those categories split. I mean, you know, kind of uh, somewhat evenly amongst them. You could say it was a, a, a bimodal distribution if you want to, and maybe it is, but it, you know, it's not bad. And so let's look at the grade distribution here. And so, um, you know, it's, somewhat uh, similar. Uh, there isn't one huge category and one tiny category. So it's A, B, C, D, F. And that's how I'm going to present these to you is um, the A's. I'm going to give you all the A's first and all the B's and all the C's and all the D's and all the F's and make some comments at the end. So you're going to see a lot of tables here with um, plant names on it. And I hope you don't get data poisoning. Uh, it happens to me when I hear talks, uh, too many talks in a row. So uh, so here's the first table. These, if you'll look at the far right column, these are all A's. And I'm going to show you a, one or two more slides of A's. So um, Abies firma, Momi fir. We have two plants, but both have survived for a number of years. So that one got an A. Um, if you look at, uh, I put a star. Uh, we love, by the way, our cephalotaxis. They do so well for us where we are. Uh, not just the Fortunii. I mean, the Fortunii is really, we have one plant, but it is really motoring along. But we have some uh, Harringtonias also that are doing very, very well for us. I put a star by the fourth um, species down, uh, the Lelandii. Uh, that one is really a junky uh, conifer. And I'm at 100%, it's at 100% survival now of the 10 plants, but I know they're going to die. They always do. And so I'm kind of holding my breath and looking the other way on that one. Uh, same with the Cupressus nutca tensis green arrow. Um, um, that one is, uh, we just keep waiting for that one to go down on us. Uh, it hasn't yet, but we're just kind of like, we don't look at it because we don't want it to, we don't want to uh, jinx it. Hopefully it'll survive. But uh, history with these has not been just history of in our own landscapes and in landscapes and, you know, planting and in town. Uh, they just tend not to do very well, but we're doing uh, okay with them. I don't know if you have any, um, that, that, uh, that one down there, that Picea yezoensis, that yezo spruce, and that thing is really a surprise for us. It's really doing well for us. Um, and I guess, of course, the it's green giant arborvitaes, I think, do well for most people if they're, they're adapted. But I don't know if there's any surprises on that list for you or not. Uh, but uh, again, on this list, we liked, I like the cephalotaxis, and I like that. Uh, yezo, uh, yezo spruce a lot. It's really a, a pleasant surprise. I'm going to move on, but if you want to go back at any time, you sure can. Um, here, these are all A's, right? And so we see that of the Cephalotexas herringtonia, the fourth one down, we have 161 plants and 98% survive. We can't kill them. They do so well for us. In fact, there's a nursery uh, in northern Ohio that we ship off uh, cuttings to because we have a certain uh, variety that they are cultivar that they really think is the best one they've ever seen of this particular cultivar. And, and we send it to them and they propagate them and send us a few back. Uh, so it's a really nice uh, relationship, but those do uh, really well. Of course, the Taxus X media, uh, th those also, and the Juniperus, you know, those are all the, um, well, two of those are the um, low growing and then the Virginia game is native here. So how are we only at 91% on the native eastern red cedar? I don't know, but uh, again, it does pretty well, okay? The most, uh, one of the most common plants we have, uh, conifer-wise, is the last one on this list, Camarociphrus obtusa, the Hinoki cypress. 86%, but a lot of that death happened before uh, the current uh, staff uh, has been there uh, at the Arboretum, and we have about 100% success rate since. And so I included that one as a low A because it should be higher. Now we're going to go to the B range. These are all B grade plants. 81% um, down in this slide. I think there's another slide, but the 67%, you can take a look at some of these. Uh, the Arizona Cypress does well for us, 80%, even though it likes a dry climate. Uh, we do have it cited whenever we cite that plant. We always put it on a well-drained site. So we kind of know what we're doing with some of these and we get them cited right and they do pretty well for us. I don't know how we only have 79% survival of Taxodium disticum, but uh, it, 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 it should be an A category plant. 
that does well for us also. Uh, Picea pungens, uh, Colorado spruce, I've got asterisk there, and let me explain that. I'm sure you've noticed this, but the ground cover form and the broom forms, the ball forms and things, do pretty well for us and live for a number of decades for us here. But the upright forms die in about 12 to 15 years. Uh, they're all grafted. They all just are grafted onto random uh, rootstocks. And I was pondering this today. I don't, I don't know if it's, it has to do with the size of the, um, the canopy size for the broom and the uh, ground cover the spruces is small compared relative ratio to the root system compared to the upright forms. I don't know if that plays into it. Ultimately, the upright forms die, I believe, that because they get a disease going, and I don't know why the ground cover ones don't suffer, but that one's an interesting case, and keep put a pin in that one, because I'm going to do something else later that will contrast against that. I put a red uh, here for Pisces orientalis, second for the bottom. That is a winner, and we had a, bad, a string of bad luck early on in the arboretum, but that is the plant that's probably the best adapted conifer for Bowling Green, Kentucky. And so that really should be an A++ plant. And I wanted to point that out. It's really a winner um, here. A couple of more uh, B grade plants. You can see there, um, the crypto, oh, the cryptomeria has a, uh, an asterisk by it as well. Uh, the, crypto, the upright cryptomerias do really well for us. The broom shape or the ball shape cryptomerias uh, don't do well for us. They crater out and die. So it's actually the opposite of the spruce, isn't it? The Colorado blue spruce. The blue spruce, the brooms do well for us. And on the cryptomeria, those uh, ball shaped or the broom forms crater on us and we do better on the upright forms. And so I can't explain it. I don't know why that's part of the wonder of biology and, and plants and mother nature, but it's a little frustrating sometimes too, not to be able to figure that out. I would be open to any discussion you wanted to have on that. Uh, C category. Take a look there in the 60s, 50s, up to the low 50s. Um, some of these, um, the white pines do okay for us. The top there, Pinostrobus, they do okay for us. We have a lot of them, but a lot of them will get this white pine decline after about 15 years and we wind up cutting them down. We just cut down a big, beautiful um, Vander, uh, see Vanderwolf. I can't remember if that's that species or not. It might be Flexilis, I can't remember, but. Uh, they get this, uh, but no, I think it's a white pine. It, it, uh, they get this decline. And so we have them for a while, but then we don't. Um, of course, the ewes do uh, generally do pretty well. They're not showing well here, but they do all right for us. Um, the Bosnian pine is pretty. The Heldrechii is pretty, but uh, it's kind of an average uh, performing plant here. The Suga canadensis is a native plant, Canadian hemlock. And, and it's at 52% here. It's, it's uh, pretty close to our average. We have 106 plants, but I, again, here's a plant that we haven't lost a single suga in 15 years. So the death of these plants happened, you know, 20 years ago when none of the current staff were here. I think this should be an A plant. It does really, but you've got to give it water where we are. If you get enough water, it'll really do well for us. And, and pretty much all of our, about half our sugas are, are uh, weeping forms. <clears throat> so I wanted to say this one is getting a bun wrap. I think the Suga has a lot of uh, promise for us. Some more C grades. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here. Um, I don't know if there may be some on here that do well for you and your area. They just don't do well for us in our area. We get a, uh, quite a bit of rain every year, some snow. It's, of course, humid in the summer. Uh, I grew up in Oklahoma and Texas, and so the fact that it rains about an inch here every week or two in the summer is dreamy. Um, and so I'm actually, I never complain about the, the lack of rainfall because it's always more than where I grew up. I, um, I want this uh, Pseudolaryx amabilis at the very bottom to do better than that because I think it's so pretty, uh, but it's just not, uh, not a good performer for us. Okay, and then uh, ginkgos at the bottom here. Uh, ginkgos, uh, we have 68 ginkgos, 38% is not too good. They also should be higher performer. It's one of the toughest landscape plants I've ever seen in our area. Um, and I wanna say that it's getting a bum wrap also. I think that one should be elevated, but the others are probably right on. And I want that cunning hamia to do better than it does. Uh, first time I saw one was at the National Arboretum uh, and uh, fell in love with it, but I can't get it above 43%. So that's probably 
not really great. I'm going to go quickly through the D's uh, because they're not good plants. Uh, you can take a uh, look at the ABs, Pinus, 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 Juniperus, Iodopides. Uh, ABs con color now is asterisk. Uh, let's see, I have two asterisks, asterisks here. Citrus Atlantica. Um, some do well and some don't do well. It seems to be hit and miss for us. If you get them sighted just right, they do really well. But if you don't get them sighted just right, they, they don't do that well. Um, I tell my, um, my students, it's interesting, this is the only common landscape plant from, Af from the continent of Africa. Uh, there aren't that many uh, landscape plants that we use from that, that continent, but that one is from uh, the Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Uh, AB's con color down there uh, doesn't do great for us at 25%, but we have, uh, uh, when we cite them right, we have found they do extremely well for us, and that is cite them on a uh, well-drained uh, position. Uh, we have candy cans that's just kicking kicking butt for us, and none of the others will, but candy cans is, seems to be a cultivar that does well for us. Some more Ds. Uh, I want Parviflora to do better because I think it's so pretty, uh, but it just isn't doing that well for us. Our, pinus, our, our pines in general don't perform as well as I would hope that they would. Um, they tend to get a nematode problem, uh, which is impossible to cure. And they've got the needle cast, uh, one of several needle casts, which is always hard to control. And we don't always have time to treat them. And so um, they they're just aren't performing quite as well as we, ever, we would like to. So I'll give you a chance to look at those and I'm going to move on to the Fs, right? Not going to spend much time on the uh, Fs either. Uh, this is um, ABs, 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 ABs. Do you see a trend there? Uh, we don't do uh, 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 that Coriana, which everybody wants. Uh, certainly we do too. Uh, we just don't do as well with ABs as uh, we would like to. The furs just don't do that well for us, as you can see. This is historic. Some more Fs. Calicedrus. These are just zeros. Um, some of them, we just have one plant. If it was planted in the wrong place or at the wrong time, it died. And maybe it's mistakenly attributed to the junk heap here. I don't know. But um, they're Fs. Um, and the numbers are low, so they may or may not be very um, reliable. But you can you can see where how we're doing. Not hiding anything. You can see how we're doing our successes and our failures. And then the last page of the Fs. And Virginia pine, <laughs> third on the list. There is native, uh, and so uh, we're just not doing something right with that one because that one obviously should should grow right. Uh, we've got a couple of sugas there. We do pretty well with the sugas, the diversifolia, the um, the, um, uh, the the native, but those two didn't do too well for us. But only three in one plants. Maybe we should we should revisit those. So here's the bottom line. Based on the data, these are the performers that do best for us in our upper south garden, uh, humid, um, hot, humid uh, um, summer gardens here at the arboretum. Uh, in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and uh, Southern Kentucky. We've got the Cephalotaxis herringtonia is a knockout. That one does so well for us. Of course, the Chinese arbovitae does well. The Green Giant arbovitae does well. The Northern Japan, uh, Japanese hemlock, Camacipris obtusa is a great plant for us and, and on and on and on. Um, ginkgo does very well. It probably does well for a lot of people. Uh, you see now, third from the bottom, I have put Taxodium disticum in this, even though I it got a C, I think. I know it can do better and I've seen it do better. And so I think it was uh, in, it was miscategorized based on the data. Uh, we all agree that uh, there was um, maybe some um, stuff going on early that they just died, but uh, they, they've been nothing but a success for us. But the early numbers pull them down to a C, but I think that's wrong. And then the, the, the Pisces oriental spruce may be the tree, uh, conifer tree to plant in our area. I just can't say it. We're going to expand our collections of that Pisces orientalis. Honorable mention, the Picea pungens, which is broom types, do so much better than the upright cultivars, right? Little ball-shaped ones grow. The, the tall tree ones don't get very tall and don't get very tree-like before they die. 
Um, the Capressus nutcatensis green arrow, um, we think, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm, I don't, I, they're from Alaska. You wouldn't think they would do as well here, but they're on that uh, coast of Alaska, south of Juneau there, uh, where it's uh, kind of cold and wet, never warm and never, uh, never super cold. Uh, the Cryptomeria japonica, again, the uprights do well for us. The brooms don't. The opposite of the Picea pungens. I think that's an interesting problem. I just don't know how to, uh, to make sense of that. Uh, the Picea abies pendula is excellent for us here, the weeping Norway spruce. And then, of course, the sugas do well. The canadensis, the native, does really well. But we figured out you've got to give it a lot of water, uh, and then it does just fine. So some pictures of conifers. This is uh, Ogon. Um, this is the um, oh, I can't, uh, Metasequoia um, Ogon, which means gold in uh, Japanese. Uh, that's the fall color. Uh, the Korean uh, Cephalotaxis, that golden one, isn't that beautiful there? The art, these are all at the Arboretum. You know, there's the one that there's a few of the um, Blue Atlas cedars that do well. This is a um, Glauca fastigiata. This is the upright one that is uh, just really killing it out in one of our main lawn areas. Uh, that's the one again from Africa. Uh, that's That blue spruce hasn't been there in 10 years. I took this picture 10 years ago, right? You see the junipers ringing, that wall are doing great. The camacypris to the left, the golden one is fine. But that dern, that's about as big as a spruce gets in Bowling Green, Kentucky and, and this part of the world. And then they just collapse and we had to cut it out. Uh, the main thing I'm showing you here is this is all conifers, by the way. It's all conifers, and there's the museum there. But that one kind of center right is that Skylands Oriental Spruce. And those, again, I can't sing the praises of Oriental Spruce enough. And that Skylands has that golden color, which blends really well with our um, stonework. And it's our signature plant at the Arboretum. Um, upper left is a, a Camacyparis. Um, and that's uh, Verdone, and in the lower right is Camacyparis, uh, and that is Verdone. If we had to pick one Camacyparis uh, obtusa that we were like, it's that Verdone, we think it's the best one for us. Uh, this is a back to that Skylands, here it is in ice, here it is in the fall. Uh, it's just a dream of a plant, it's upright. Look how it mirrors the silo portion, the upright portion of the museum. The color goes well with the uh, stucco of the museum and then the stonework there. It's really just, it's a plant made to grow where it grows right there in the Arboretum. Uh, this is a taxis that just blows me away every spring. It looks like this and in, in, in the late summer and now it's just as dark green as it can be, but the new growth is uh, spectacular and, and the taxis tend to do well as long as we keep them, the roots dry, right? It does well. This is Cephalotaxis herringtonia prostrata. And this is the one that the nursery likes to come and have us ship, um, or they don't come here, but we ship them cuttings. They root them uh, off this plant, hanging on a wall. It's just a, a dream of a, of a plant for us. And this particular strain of this cultivar is especially strong and clear and disease-free. There it is again. The hemlocks, especially pretty in snow, don't you agree? sitting above the wall there, but they get irrigation. And I want to thank um, our recently retired accessionist and GIS person, Peggy McKillop. She's a horticulturist, got a degree from the University of uh, Georgia, good horticulture school. And she's been our record keeper. That's her computer there. And she compiled these notes and she just retired after 16 years. And so uh, I want to certainly recognize Peggy as our, um, as our accessionist and data grabber. Okay, and so I want to thank you all for visiting the Baker Arboretum with me today. And I'm going to turn off the PowerPoint and come back on and um, ask you uh, as uh, the old professor's coming out in me, but do you have any questions of, about uh, what we talked about that today? Great. That was great. Um. I, I don't mean to or would never want to overwhelm anybody with Latin names, but I don't know how you can be accurate and use common names, right? And so the Latin can be a little off-putting to some people, I understand, but I, I appreciate you all um, staying with me on it. Well, I'm glad that you're uh, singing the praises of Picea orientalis because that's my favorite plant. 
I said, oh yeah, you know, that plant is, um, I, I just wasn't familiar with it before I moved to Kentucky. I was from out West and uh, I, I, I just can't believe how well it does here, you know, and uh, when people want to argue with me about, you know, native plants, I'm like, man, the best plant is Picea orientalis, and it is not from Kentucky, uh, but it does really well in our climate, and Jennifer, I'm glad to hear that it's doing well. You're a little bit warmer than us. You're, I don't know, 60 or 80 miles south of us, maybe not that far, uh, and I'm glad it's it's doing well for you. Yeah, we had them in New York, so we brought them with us here, and we have them in full sun and shade and in between, and they all do fabulous. So you had them in New York. You were up by uh, Rochester, yeah. is that right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Zone five. So that's great. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I think people in the South don't really think that they can grow them, but you can. Well, we know the uh, landscape architect in Charlotte that plants them everywhere. He buys um, big six, eight foot uh, Vander, or not Vander Acking, and puts them everywhere in Charlotte. And he says they do fabulous. And Charlotte is like zone 8B or something yeah, crazy oh, like yeah. that. <laughs> so Charlotte has a little advantage from that uh, Gulf Stream that runs up beside the uh, East Coast there. Yeah, they get uh, some good breezes, I think, right? With your. Um grading system there, uh, does that include any intervention in terms of spraying for disease or insects? Yeah, you know, that's a really good good question. Uh, yes, it does. This is just survival. Uh, cause of death is not taken into account. Health is not taken into account. It's a one or a zero. They're alive or they're dead. Uh, we do spray. Uh, we, don't, we could spray more but uh, we do spray. A lot of times our spray is uh, trying to kill weeds um, uh, and that's why our pines are a little bit declining. Uh, we don't spray as much as we should, but um, yeah, that's a very good point. That, that is us taking ultimate, as good a care of them as we can. So is your spraying more proactive or curative? Uh, we only spray, we don't spray prophylactically. Uh, we spray, uh, if we see a problem, we spray. Uh, if, if certain plants have a history, like so this Dothrostroma needle uh, blight in pines uh, or other uh, needle conifers is a real killer and it can really cause the decline of a, of a plant. And we know that we should spray those uh, prophylactically because we know we're going to have that problem every year. And when you, you spray this year, you're really treating, you know, a problem for next year. And if you're having trouble this year, you should have treated last year and so you're gonna to have to stay on top of that one but but generally we try not to spray unless we see uh, that there's a problem thank you martin i have a question for you hey byron yeah sure any any chance that uh you would ever take a plant like a new contentious green arrow and plant them near each other, one that was grafted and one that was on its own root to uh, document the difference in growth? I, I'd love to do that. Uh, yeah, I haven't thought of that, uh, but that would be an interesting... Um, do, do you have reason to suspect that uh, something interesting might occur? Uh, the rationale is that the one that's grafted will be far more vigorous and have far more side branching. The one on its own root will really be straight as an arrow and narrow. At least that's what the Europeans say. I, I wish I could tell you which ones we had. I appreciate you telling me that. I'll have to go back and, and we got those from Gary G up at, uh, in Michigan is where those came out of. And I don't remember how he grew those. I, 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 I'll note that Byron and, and look that up. So we were wondering, what is the Picea jesunensis? Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we have a few of those, <laughs> and they're just really kicking, kicking butt. Uh, they just and they look cool, and I don't have a picture because there's no way I could have included all the pictures. Um, I don't know, Tracy, if you 
if that one is uh, one that you come across very often that Yeza wins us, uh, but uh, it is, uh, it just, it's, it's hitting it just right with us and uh, kind of came out of the blue. It looks good. I don't know. We probably got it. I'm sure we got it at an ACS uh, auction or sale or something, but uh, I don't know if any of you have ever grown that one, but it just seems to do well for us. And we have two of those in uh, Virginia that are doing quite well. Oh, oh good. A similar climate, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, Jeff, I have Yazuwinsis Cheeto Samaru, and it does, it's very slow, but oh my gosh, it's, it's one you drool over. Oh. Where's their native range? Is it like southwest or something? Or It's a, it's a Chinese spruce, so right. I'm not sure how that equates to America. Okay. But our zones aren't that different. Uh -oh. No, you guys are pretty close. Fascinating. And we've noticed the- It's one of, it, I was just gonna say, it's one of those plants that you just don't pay attention to, then you walk by it one day and it just like, wow, where did that one come from? Uh, huh. It just it just really grabs you and, and it's unexpected. Cool, we'll have to look for them. But, uh, we noticed we've tried to plant hemlocks over the last three or four years, if not longer. And uh, we've had some bad droughts and uh, we're not able to irrigate some places very well. And gosh, when they get dry, they're all done. <laughs> that's true. Uh, that is absolutely true. And, and, and that's why I said on that talk that uh, if you can give them enough water, they'll survive. But we had to learn that lesson. We, we were going the other way. We're trying to keep them too dry for a while. Yes. Well, we couldn't grow parfa for for the longest time. We finally put it on a, we made berms in one part of our yard and put it at the top of a berm and it's doing good. <laughs> so we don't know if it uh, needs to have dry feet, I guess. At least that's what we're thinking at this point. It sounds like it. Yeah. So that was great. Um, about the camera cypress. How can he grow all these? Oh, Jennifer is jealous of all your camera cypress growing abilities because the last two years we've had really wet winters and springs and we lost a lot. Um, I initially thought it was because they're drying out in the winter because we also had really bad cold spells, but it was also really wet. Um, and we're just trying to figure out why all of a sudden we can't grow camia cypress over the last three years. <laughs> we do best with obtusa, uh, by far the best. Uh, second best for us is gonna be Lasoniana. Uh, and then the, the least one for us is Pisifera, P-I-S-I-F-E-R-A. And it's from the Pacific Northwest. And it, it's a it's a it's a lift to get that one to grow, but the obtuses should be pretty easy for for your area there, Jeff. Well, that's what we thought too. So yeah. <laughs> we're wondering if the I think we pH, have zero left. <laughs> uh, I wonder if my pH has changed. Um, well, I know it's changed. It uh, has gone down a little bit in some spots. So um, I'm gonna have to check that because that might be my entire problem. Is the pH has changed on me? Uh, it could be that, uh, Jeff, but uh, we've had trouble with our camisipris and it would burn in the winter, in the spring. It looked great and all of a sudden it started to brown out. And if you talk to Dennis Grow, his, his are doing well and he puts them on the north side of his house. So they get shade in the winter and they don't get the winter sun and that's helped out a lot. Okay, yes, ours are in pretty much full sun, so... Yeah, Especially the ones we lost. <laughs> try, try an experiment and move some of them, and so they get winter shade. We will. We can. Pull so they're all dead. <laughs> I can afford to try one more in the shade. <laughs> and then, as far as the Pisces pungens, here up in Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, um, uh, doesn't recommend you grow them. The, the normal full-size tree. And uh, we had quite a few on our property when we first moved here and we've lost almost all of them to needle blight. And they say it's because it, it's a Colorado blue spruce. It likes the mountains. It likes it cool and dry and very well drained. And we just don't have that environment here. 
I think yeah, you're sure. at some point you get up you get up north in in uh in Wisconsin you you reach a certain area in Wisconsin and, and they do okay uh, mm -hmm. but but it's it's north Martin I have one more uh, with the logo of the Baker Arboretum that's so beautiful I was wondering if Jeff has shared with you Oh, uh, the fact that he's found a beautiful witch's broom in a ginkgo in his landscape. <laughs> no, uh, Jeff, uh, I, I designed that logo. Thank you. Uh, my daughter made me a, a ginkgo. Uh, we went to China and, and she made me a ginkgo leaf with the Chinese word for ginkgo under it for Christmas one year. And I was looking at it one day and I said, that leaf looks like a tree. And so uh, it became our logo. But um uh, Jeff, what's the? Can I have a piece of your uh, ginkgo? Or yes, it's it's very tight. Um, it's little right now. It's about the size of a racquetball. <laughs> so um, oh gosh, <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it is like right now the whole thing is only about that big. Um, but gosh, the internodes on the buds is only about a quarter inch, and the buds are like you know, three eighths of an inch. So the buds almost touch each other. It's, it's insane. Um, so Byron has dreams about it. <laughs> so yes, as soon as we get something where I can safely take something off, um, we're going to get it going. So um, I'm still scared because it's so small. <laughs> um, I, I'll share with you that the last, uh, so speaking of ginkgo, uh, we only have the brooms. We've lost probably eight um, cultivars because um, in the heat of the summer, we noticed they started to wilt. And so when you go to investigate, you start to look around the root system and the collar there. And we found that the cambium layer had been removed about one or two inches tall all the way around the base of some of our geckos and uh, the little devils we figured out were doing it in the winter time when nobody notices and the leaves are off and so they don't desiccate and then when it comes uh, time to really make a pull on that vascular system and get the water into the leaf of course it fails miserably uh, and so uh, be careful with that ginkgo we've had some real heartbreak this last couple of years uh, what we've wound up doing is uh, we even put the little uh tubes around the tree trunks, you know, the little, uh, and it didn't stop them. But what did seem to work is we painted the bottoms of it with the, the tree tar. You're not supposed to paint tree tar on uh, wounds anymore, but we had some left over and it's kind of stinky and tarry. And we, we painted six or eight inches and it's kept them away. That's awesome. We have Has anybody else lost any, anybody else lost any geckos to uh, rodents? Yes. <laughs> We had one, our most expensive one. Um, we moved a couple times because it wasn't doing well. And we put it where we could actually see it better one year. And we saw the rabbits eating it. The rabbits love ginkgo. to eat ginkgo bark oh. in the wintertime. It is unbelievable. The first plant they'll go to, they'll go to a ginkgo and it'll be the most expensive one. <laughs> <laughs> and we couldn't figure out what was going on because you know we couldn't see it before and then one day we went out and we saw the rabbits chowing down on it and uh yeah so they love that ginkgo bark <laughs> so well the, of course the first one they killed of ours was our most expensive ginkgo that we bought at a conifer society auction yeah. oh know, not the, that the very price drove one. does it depend on yes it? Does it depend oh. on, like the caliper of the tree well, we've had it happen. Uh, but Jeff, by the way, J Jeff, we did graft. We've got one. We grafted that one. We've got one remaining. Okay, so we did save it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's good. Oh, my gosh. That thing was amazing. Yeah, I'm, um, yeah, but, I'm sorry to interrupt, Tracy. Uh, I was just wondering if, if this damage has occurred to younger trees. I mean, I have a lot of rabbits. I haven't I haven't seen that. I, we've lost ginkgos, but not to rabbits. I'm just wondering if it's the yes. caliper of the tree. Yes, the smaller. Um, like, so if you were to protect them with a guard, a wrap or something. Well, I started putting um, the hardware cloth. It's like a quarter inch mesh. 
and I'll cut like a six it's inch. It's not tree. bulls, it's rabbits. Oh, yeah. Well, it's true. both <laughs> because it's both. <laughs> um, but that's why I got the quarter inch mesh hardware cloth, they call it. And it's like a quarter inch metal mesh. And I'll make like a six inch circle and put it like an inch or two under the mulch and sticking up to about eight to 12 inches um, to keep the moles and the mice and the rabbits away from them. Um, but gosh, they love that tender young ginkgo bark. It's a delicacy. It's like deer <laughs> too. Have you ever tried snapdragons as a deterrent? No, that, that, I think that'll work. I, I put snapdragons in my vegetable garden one year and they haven't come back, the rabbits. Oh. So I had heard snapdragons somehow for some reason awesome. are repellent to rabbits. Cool. They don't I, was, I was really mean to our deer after um, a couple of years of losing all our tulips and I put foxgloves next to the tulips. <laughs> <laughs> it works. <laughs> Well, I'll try the snapdragons. That's, that sounds pretty cool. I lost a, uh, uh, a um, Kurtamiria geocomo. Um, it turned out that it was snowed about three weeks right before Christmas, it snowed, and about three inches here, and it weighed on this geocomo, and it, and it literally just ripped it out of the ground. And I looked at the root ball, and there was there was basically nothing left. The, the voles had gotten underneath it and just yeah. eaten the roots completely off of it. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was just about nothing left of it, and it was just it was just standing there with no roots, and the yeah. snow just <laughs> fell it over. It was it was about an eight foot tall, eight foot. Tall. Wow. I have, to, I have to go there and look. Yeah, a funny thing about bulls was when we lived in New York, we um, were heavily into roses. They did great for us up there. But we had a 10 foot by 10 foot um, English rose next to our vegetable garden. Gorgeous. I mean, healthy as all could be. Um, we pruned it in the early spring like you're supposed to. We couldn't figure out why it wasn't growing after everything else was doing great. So we go there. And we went to print it back again, thinking that, well, you know, we still have some dieback. Put the pruners on it, and the whole thing lifted up. It looked like a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> the bulls had just coned the whole thing down to like six inches, nothing left of it. Those bulls are tough. They're sneaky. Mm -hmm. Evil. Evil. <laughs> <laughs> Evil. I agree. Oh, that was great. Anything else? Anything, any other questions? Anything else? Well, it's Thanks awesome. For those of you who have, for those of you who have not been, many of you have been, those of, for those of you who have not been to the Arboretum, it's free. Uh, it's a pretty cheap date. Uh, so come on down. And if you let me know you're coming and you're in the American Conference Society, um, I'll give you a tour or one of the horticulturists, our horticulturists will give you a tour take you behind the scenes, take you to places where the public isn't really um, open uh, to coming to see. So I welcome you all down. Well, that's a great offer right there. I've been on that behind the scenes tour and we saw some cool stuff. <laughs> mm -hmm. I was on, I was on the, um, attended the conference when y'all hosted it um, for the Connor for Society a few years ago. And it was, it was absolutely a wonderful event there. It was very nice. Mm -hmm. I still have my hyper tufa paper tufas. Oh, that, we, that, that was we, fun. I yeah. still have them. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I was looking through pictures the other day for something, and I found the picture of all the hyper tufas lined up on this brick wall. <laughs> I was like, "What are you guys all doing?" <laughs> that was good. That was a fun time. That was 2017. It was uh, yeah, not that long ago, and yet Kawada feels like it might have been a while ago. <laughs> oh, after 2020, it feels like it was a long time ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but we are having our another meeting uh, is lined up. Uh, thanks to David and Sherry, we've called it the Open Air Rendezvous. Uh, we were struggling for a name. We, we, we like that one. <laughs> 
So it's going to be May 1st in Knoxville. We're going to see um, Dr. Solomon's garden. Uh, he named it Gatop, uh, God's answer to our prayers. Um, it's at the top of a mountain overlooking um, the river, and uh, it's on an old marble quarry. Um, and he's done an unbelievable job on it. It's 25 acres or so. Um, it's we have plenty of uh, room to, you know, elbow room and not have to crowd each other. Um, and we're going to have uh, a brief special meeting um, to approve our bylaw revisions that Byron worked on. Um, kind of important uh, happening, and it's a couple of great gardens to look at while we're there. So. Uh, hopefully everybody will uh, be able to make it. The only thing you need to do to register is email me and uh, we'll keep you on the list and uh, let you know what else we add to the, to the weekend. So hopefully uh, a lot of you can make it. We all set? All right. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Stone. We appreciate it. Thank you.